Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us an opportunity here in Baltimore in the heart of the East Coast to meet and discuss about our responsibilities in raising our kids. And Jazakallahu khairan kathira, Dr. Suzy Ismail, for sharing her insights about dealing with the brevity in teens. So the topic I was uh, actually given is about internal changes in adolescence. And I will not go deeper into this topic before uh, quoting one of the uh, known shuyukh in da'wah. And he uh, said something really insightful. And he said that the youth of our ummah used to lead armies at the age of 14, 15, 16, and 17. And the youth of the 21st century also leads armies, but only on Xbox. So that made me think that what must have led towards that retardation, that physically people are growing the same way as they did maybe 1400 years ago or even 2000 years ago. However, there is a contrast, there is a drastic change between the maturity people a few thousand years ago attained than the people of now, the 21st century. And this has been going down with each coming year. So I'm not passing a statement or a judgment. It's my observation, and it must be your observation as well, as parents, as grandparents, as older siblings to younger siblings, as teachers, mentors, comparing your students, your children's, childhood days to your own, and as obviously Sister Susie mentioned, that each generation is different than the previous one. And I remember last year, she had quoted a beautiful hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, that we <clears throat> should not raise our kids the same way as we grew up. So this is an interpretation of his quote. And <clears throat> so I'll shed a few points over the internal changes in adolescence. So when we think of adolescence, that is a transition between childhood and adulthood. A transition between childhood and adulthood. Now, when you think of childhood, what age comes to your mind? Uh, beg your pardon? Uh, what age to watch age? One year old or newborn to? Nine, Nine? 12 to 16? Okay. Now, uh, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave da'wah, the majority of the first responders to his call were the youth. They were what we may define as early teens or mid-teenagers or later teenagers. Amongst them were <clears throat> Mus'ab ibn Umair, whose story is pretty famous around, and others of his likes, of his caliber. Now, what was that that motivated those kids and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to rely upon them, to work upon them, and have confidence in them? So let's go through some of the internal processes, internal changes that youth, or what we may define as uh, adolescents, go through when growing up. So I will, in fact, not me, psychologists generally, typically divide adolescents into three phases. phases. Uh, first phase is the early phase, that is 
the period between 10 years to 13 years of age. And then there is a second phase that is the middle phase of adolescence, and that is from 14 years to 16 years of age. And then comes the late phase in adolescence, and that is between 17 years of age up until 19 years of age. By the way, when we say early phase of adolescence, middle phase of adolescence, or later phase of adolescence, we are not to be like very specific by the ages. It's a rough estimate. It varies from culture to culture, from uh, society to society. So in the developed world, in the developed world, uh, let's say in US, UK, in the first world countries, basically, the uh, puberty is attained, obviously, earlier. Uh, however, at the same time, emotional stability is found to come relatively later than other parts of the world. Reason being that in other parts of the world that are relatively less developed parts of the world, uh, the responsibilities come on the shoulders of kids of youth, of adolescents, or what we may call teenagers, come pretty early. And as a result of that, they build that concept of accountability, and they become responsible citizens as a result of those responsibilities, be them the household responsibilities of cleaning, maintaining, helping parents, or be them earning livelihood responsibility to contribute as much as they can uh, to the running of the family costs. Now, <clears throat> our brain, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created it, is something really amazing. So when we think about changes in adolescence, majority of us think of the physical changes, the physical body changes, maybe, you know, hair growing, uh, in different parts of the body, maybe the changing of the voice, maybe, you know, the other uh, aspects of emotions. But most of us uh, do not, or in fact, miss the point that they are simply a manifestation of how every body is supposed to grow. But what is in our hands is the intellectual, the cognitive uh, growth, the uh, you, could, uh, you could say the, uh, the growth of your mind as an intellectual, the growth of your mind as, uh, you know, as a bunch of emotion uh, processing unit. That is what we can work on as uh, parents, as teachers, as community leaders of our kids. And how can that be influenced? For the first few, for the first, I'd say, a third of the teenagers that I defined as the early teenagers, ranging from 10 to 13, that sees, uh, I'd say, extreme growth in the prefrontal cortex of our brains and the limbic system of our brains. Now, the prefrontal cortex, that uh, part of our brain that performs the function of uh, basically, uh, you know, intelligence of higher order things in life, when uh, which have to do with planning, making judgments, and other stuff that starts off and that goes on beyond 20s. Whereas the limbic system that is in charge of, you know, building our emotions, that is in charge of determining how we respond or react to our emotions, that takes place pretty much in the first two thirds of our teenagers, that is from 10 years up until 16 years. And the moment we pass 16, 17, and 18, that part of our brain basically has molded sufficiently, and that mold determines how we will generally react to things for the rest of our lives. So for example, there is this inter interesting term that uh, we uh, call in, uh, 
brain development that is the new neural connections and the disconnecting of all neural connections. That is, uh, for example, if uh, I do too much of reading in, in my early teenagers, in my mid-teenagers, in my later part of teenagers, it builds the neurons to get used to the culture of processing information faster when we read. And as a result of that, the moment I enter into my adulthood, I will be a good reader. I will be a person who would be a thinker. And similarly, if I spend time in physical activities, outdoor activities, teamwork in that time frame, that activity would build my neural connections in a way that would help me in my adulthood. Dealing with people, nicely, dealing with people in a mature way, dealing with people uh, wisely. Similarly, if I misuse that process and expose myself as a kid to, let's say, extreme exposure of television, extreme exposure to media, extreme exposure to cartoons, animations, extreme exposure to negatives in the society, extreme exposure to procrastination, extreme exposure to the so-called concept of carelessness or fun. That would mold my years to come, and as an adult, it would be a challenging task for me to undo that damage. So we as kids, when we were kids, were kind of powerless in many ways. We simply reacted, responded, and dealt with what we were surrounded by. And it is parents job, the teacher's job, the mentor's job, the coach's job to provide the right environment for the kids to nurture in. Because when our brain develops, new neural connections are made. The old, less frequently used neural connections are disconnected, are cut off. And this is a 24-7 process that our brain keeps doing since we are born until we are like into 20s, early 20s. So the earlier we build habits as parents, for our kids, in fact, facilitate them. We cannot build habits for our kids. We can facilitate them, give them direction, give them food for thought. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my father has been a sailor, alhamdulillah, for most part of his life. And we have sailed with him across the world. And back in the days when emails were not that common, cell phones were not that common, our communication with our father was through the letters. And the letters were such that you know, he'd write us a letter on a port and the letter would reach us in a month's time or two months time and then we would respond back. That letter would reach him in a couple of months time again. So that was the communication gap. However, I don't remember any letter of my father that was void, that did not mention the mention of hereafter, the mention of akhirah, the mention of uh, preparing for facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if that is something so major that even if I am a kid, I should be thinking about it. When I say kid, I don't mean to say toddlers. I don't mean to say like uh, people in their six, seven years of age or eight years of age. At least like you could say beyond seven years, teenagers and onwards because our accountability begins the moment salah becomes mandatory and the moment salah becomes mandatory if i die even if i am 13 or 14 in the eyes of society i am a kid but in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our deen i am not a kid so we need to redefine that there is a psychological definition of a kid based on the developmental needs of children and there is a spiritual definition of a kid, a child or children that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can wait to us as how we must worry 
about our akhirah. Qū anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Qur'an, save yourself and your families from fire. So this very thought that my father instilled in me, in my siblings, even if, you know, even when I was in my early teens, I would not freak out by the concept of death. Because many a times, parents cover or conceal the concept of death in front of a child. Parents say that, oh, don't talk about grave in front of him. Don't talk, yes. We shouldn't be talking about punishments at, at an age that would make the child build, you know, wrong neural connections in his mind or her mind. Rather, we should build and start by building the awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Building, instilling the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hearts. And how would that come? That would not come simply by our tongue, by our lip service. That would come by parents modeling that behavior. By parents saying subhanallah every now and then. By parents saying astaghfirullah every now and then. Now based on the procedures that I mentioned that happen in every child's brain, every human's brain, that in no way absolve me and you and our kids that because that process is taking place, it justifies sinning. Because that process is taking place, it justifies rebellion. No, these things are natural. That is why Prophet Muhammad wasallam said in a powerful hadith that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put seven people under his shade when there will be no other shade but his. And a youth, a pious youth who spent his young age worshipping Allah, that is indeed a tough job. We all know that. Parents can manifest that by modeling that behavior, modeling that, uh, that taqwa, modeling that piety, and kids will emulate. And at the same time, it reminds me of the ayah, the story of Surah Al-Kahf, the interaction between Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam, where Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam uh, are into a town. They enter a town where Khidr alayhi salam, with the help of Musa alayhi salam, repairs a wall that was about to fall. And uh, Musa alayhi salam asked Khidr alayhi salam to take a compensation. However, the people refused and Khidr alayhi salam said that you cannot be patient with me. The crux of this story was the justification given by Khidr alayhi salam is those two orphan boys whose treasure, whose wealth was hiding behind that wall. Their parents were salih. Their parents were righteous. And because their parents were righteous, Allah ensured that they get their rizq, they get their wealth, that they get their sustenance when they grow up. So the key is for us parents to be righteous, for us parents to seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sought for his kids, what Ashab rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sought for his kids. So the internal changes, knowing them is helpful. We could perhaps justify things, but that might make us come up with solutions that would, you know, eventually help our kids grow up as responsible Muslims because teenagers have nothing to do with being absolved of the responsibilities of accountability in the hereafter, in the, uh, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us accountable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us live up to the expectations that Allah has from Muslim parents. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and our children of their shortcomings. And may he make them our sadqa jariyah. Jazakumullahu khairan kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.